Hey, I'm Pete Peterson of DirtRider.com. I'm here at the Matrix offices. We're looking at a new product. It's from 1.7. I'm here with Bob, Hurricane Hannah. He's going to tell you a little bit about this cleaning system. Well, Pete, the 1.7 is uh, Eddie Cole's new idea of how to prepare your bike from start to finish. Uh, engine degreaser, plastic and rubber protectant, hard parts shiner, uh, stuff to put your tires on to lube your tires up, stuff to clean your hands, and stuff to uh, shine the hard parts. So it's a uh, do-all for your uh, motorcycle to keep it clean and shiny. And should people use this system? People should use this. If you rode YZs when I was a kid, you should use this stuff to clean your bike now, even if you're not on a YZ. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, thank you for that. Can we talk a little bit about your racing days? We can. Okay, what I want to do is I want to hear, because you're famous for using kind of anger as a motivation, and you would, you would hate your competitors as a way to motivate you, and you were just telling me earlier about uh, tell me what you're talking about when there was 40 guys on the line back then, because I used to have 40 guys on the row. Uh, tell me what would go through your head different that day versus Tuesday. It really wasn't what went through my head, Pete. It was what went through their head. Uh, I've sat on the line before within two minutes to go when the gate's going to drop, and I'd hear the guy next to me tell his mechanic, you know, I really haven't been doing my training like I should, but next week I'm going to start to go. We're in the middle of the season now, and next week I'm going to. Everybody wants to win the race feet on the line. It's the guys that wanted to win the race three months ago, and on three months ago, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Sunday, everybody wants to win the race. You don't win the race Sunday. You don't win the race last week. You don't win the race two weeks ago. You win the race months ago in, prepar in preparation. And, uh, and the reason I used the guys to hate them, it gave me motivation. At, at, all, at all points in my career, I had somebody giving me a hard time, taking money from me, taking the race win from me, taking my job. And whether it was Mark Barnett or Marty Trepes or, or Jimmy Weinert or Roger DeCoster, at any given point, I hated any one of those guys. And I would be running my 10 miles in the morning thinking of Ken Howerton. And I go, Ken Howerton is not going to take my money this weekend. And he's not going to take my uh, win from me. And it's very hard to get up Monday morning and go back to training. And training Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning after you're beat up on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And you have to get motivation. And for a guy that doesn't use motivation like that, I, I don't really understand that. I'm not having a love affair with these guys. I didn't want to hug them on Sunday. It was all I could do to smile at them on Sunday, okay? I mean, there's some good guys out there, but when we're racing, we're racing. Ten years later, I'll shake their hand. I don't really care to. You just said something you said about you don't want Ken Howard to take your money. You told me earlier that money isn't the motivation. Can you give me that comment again about how money, money, money is not a motivator to people for very long. I don't, I don't believe, not in sports. Uh, basketball players, football players, they all make a lot of money. And it may motivate them when they're broke. But within six months, it's not a motivator. They're already getting some money. You have to have heart. You have to have desire. You have to have ego. And if you don't have those three things, you're, you're, you're nobody. And you got to want it. You, you have to, you know, ego will get you to that race. Desire will have you start training. You know, the desire you will get you training for those races. And on the race day, 30 minutes into a 45-minute moto, and you're down and out, and somebody's giving you a lot of trouble, and you, you're just beat. You need to have heart. If you have heart, you don't have any heart, you're dead. You're, you're dead. Ego won't beat it that day. Ego won't pull you through that day. Wanting that money won't pull you through that day because you're going to go, okay, I got enough money. I, I got to give up. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to give up at that point. I have given up at that point. I've given up enough to let a guy go and go, okay, I train all my life for this. I have a factory ride, I have a good bike, I've been training for months, and here I am letting this guy, Mark Barnett, pass me. And I've gone back by and got him. When I was about to quit, and that's pure heart. And if you don't have that heart, you're worthless. Some other motivations you talked about, ego and also pride. Tell me that story about the first time you saw Roger DeCoster, who at that point was five-time world champion, and you were a struggling racer. 
I was a privateer, or basically I was sponsored by Suzuki for local races, and Roger comes over to the U.S. to ride the Trans Am in 1975, and I'm in the shop like this, somewhat like this shop, working on my bike. I'm in, a, I'm in the front offices using the restroom. It's the only reason they allow me in there. <laughs> and uh, I walk out of the restroom, and I realize that this whole office building is very quiet. And I'm thinking, there's maybe a bomb is going to go off in here, right? What's going on in here? And people are standing up out of their cubicles, standing there staring at stuff. And I look around, and I see what, what they're looking at. And they're looking at Roger DeCoster just walk through. I mean, the whole place gets silent. And people point. And people look, and, you know, hey, Roger DeCoster, <laughs> you know? And that was the first time I ever saw him. I mean, he has quite a presence. I mean, it's like God walking through the building. Yeah. I mean, you just go... <laughs> and at that point, did you think that you realistically had a shot of being that guy that you did? I don't, I don't know that I thought I had. No. I don't think I think I had a shot at being him, but I wanted it drastically. I would go in that front office and read posters of the race results because they, Suzuki at that time was really behind their riders. And after each week, they would have posters of, of uh, Roger, Tony Stefano, Billy Grassi on the walls telling the people in there, what they did and how they did it and the whole the whole race scene to keep those people motivated to work and backing those riders because they knew that sales needed those riders to win races and everybody had to work as a team and those riders were held up as gods and i really wanted that badly i said i want to be on that poster on that wall having those people love me Mm -hmm. And call it ego, call it uh, jealousy, call it what you want. I wanted it. I wanted to walk through a building and have the respect that Roger DeCoster had. When I walk in and people go, I wanted that. You know, I don't look for it anymore. I don't look for it anymore, but I did get that. Yeah. And I walk into a place and people point, they look or whatever, which nowadays really doesn't you really kind of don't like that. <laughs> but at that point, that's what I wanted. I said, I want the respect that man has because he is something. Yeah. And, then and still is. He still is. He still has it. So Roger DeCosta is a legend in the sport. He's a god. Bob Hanna is a legend in the sport. Whose legacy is greater in your mind? In my mind, he. Because I know, I, know, I know how tough he is. I know how dedicated he is. I know how he, how, how he strives to win. I know how tough the man is. And I know, to be honest, I mean, if you've got to be honest in that question, I have beat him. I waited till he was old, <laughs> and I was good, mm -hmm. and that's when I beat him. Put me on the same bike, on the same day, at the same age, on the same track in Europe, on a real track, for 45 minutes. I don't want anything to do with him. Did you get along with him as a racer when you guys were no, battling on the no, track? No, 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 no. When we were battling on the track, we're two peas in a pod. Two peas in the pod. We're not going to ever get along. You know, uh, in the pits, we could get along if there's nothing going on. But you, you start getting within 10 minutes of that race, it's going to be a couple of cobras. Okay. You know, now, yeah, I like them. We both know that we come from the same background, and we both have the same desire, heart, ego, drive. We're, we're the same. But uh, I don't take anything away from him. I don't want anything to do with him on the same day, same age, same bike. I don't want to race him. He's got you. He's, he's the man. He's the man. He, he always was, always will be. Right. And, there, and there's a lot of guys that know that. Let's go for something. Whether they'll admit it, I don't know. Yeah. They, Heike McCullough knows that. Ask him. Yeah. Because Heike McCullough was another guy that you don't want to mess with. He's an animal. And those two animals get together on that same day. You do not want to be in that race. <laughs> You, know, you don't want anything to do with that. I don't care what your name is, McGrath or Carmichael. You don't want in that race. Yeah. Well, you were you were racing when there were a lot of great competitors, and it wouldn't be a Bob Hanna video if we didn't have you commenting on some of these other guys. So, in my mind, your big your big uh, nemesis was Ken Howerton. Ken Howerton was at a time in, in uh, eighty. He, well, he was, a, he was a competitor in 78, 79, 80. When I broke my leg in 79, the real Ken Howerton in 80 and 81 is because I'm coming back from a broken leg. That's when we really had our issues. And it was all, it was, uh, he has a good reason for that. When I'm gone in, in 78, 79, I'm the man. In 80, I'm not there. He wins. He takes a lot of flack saying he's the champ, but Hannah's not here. Mm -hmm. That will wear on anybody. But when I come back in 81... 
he's a little overbearing to me. You know, he's doing interviews in the magazines like, I, I'm going to beat Hannah so bad that he's going to want to quit. It doesn't go over real big with me. Mm -hmm. You know, it wouldn't go over real big. He was adding gasoline to a fire there. And so what would you do midweek? Was he the guy you had? I know you used to train with a boxing, with a punching bag. Was he the guy whose photo you had over no, the No, and the bag? punching bag was early in 76, 77, 78. Well, I had Roger DeCosta up there because he's the man who was behind the punching bag, and, that, and that's who I wanted to beat. Okay. And then the Trans Ams, that was the goal to beat. He was the best in the world, and that's where I sat my standards yeah. right there. I didn't think of anybody else, really. I say, if you look at the best in the world, you copy. I emulated him. I stole many secrets from his writing, and I thought about him daily. I thought, I thought about Roger daily. Through, I remember showing David Bailey and John O'Mara technique of Roger. Roger was riding at a Honda test track in 83 when I could beat Roger handedly. I mean, he was an older guy, but I would show David and, and Johnny. I go watch him. I can tell you the corner. I said, watch him come through that off-camera corner, O'Mara and David. I go watch this, how the technique he uses, and show him. I go, tell me that's not wild. You know, He does something in an off-camera corner. I can tell you about it later if you want, but he does something very unique and unorthodox and uh, I go look how good it works because he can go through that corner faster than us and he's I don't know how old he is he's um, 27 he's 39 years old and look at him mm -hmm. you know he was the man then he wasn't the world champion and he's older than us but he still knew more than any of okay, us he well, forgot you, half this stuff you have to tell us what's the technique how do you get around that he had work? he has a real unorthodox off camber traction technique and he's now Roger always stood to the last possible second and it's a great deal you stand he rides very knees tight he stands to the last possible second he's looking at the spot where he's going to turn and if that's if that spot is the outside berm that's fine that's his breaking point that's where he's going to break to now if a guy falls in there he would change his spot it may go six or eight feet further inside he changes he doesn't sit down at the same point back here he runs it in eight more feet fast breaks knees tight at the last second sits down last second so, so that bike those bikes in those old days weren't as perfect as these days he's bouncing around on the bike kicking up and down he doesn't sit down the last second when he's ready to let off the brakes and turn, dive on the bike. Yeah. Now, typically he would not lean back. He really wouldn't lean back like this technique. He'd go through the corner, but he'd jump down, run the very low seat, get the center of gravity down. He'd dive in the corner. Immediately as soon as he gets the gas on, foot back, up off the seat and back. But in an off-camper corner, he would drive down the last second, nail it down like this, and when he rolls back, he doesn't slide back. He just bends his back. He bends his back, not this way, he bends his back that way. Okay, now pick it up right from there. On the back, on the, when he comes into the corner. Yeah, the yeah, back. Yeah, so what, what, does, he, the, what the, does he do different when he comes the into the The unorthodox door? spot, typically he would be bent over. Typically he hunches over and so do I, very exaggerated in the forward position. In an off-camber corner where it was very, very slippery, very hard to roll, throttle control was everything. And to roll a throttle on, rather than being hunched over like this and trying to slide back for traction, Roger would be right there and he'd start to roll a throttle on. He would bend his back like this to get the weight on the back wheel. Very strange. Because first of all, you are vulnerable to get kicked off the bike or whatever. Or get, I mean, I never could emulate that. I did not like that position. Uh -huh. But he was fabulous at it. And we'd have trouble rolling the throttle on and we'd be sliding around. And he'd just bend back, put the weight on the back of the bike and roll it on and that thing would just go wow. And did Bailey and Omaro pick it up oh, yeah. and use it? I don't know that they used it, but we watched him and I said, man, how weird is that? Well, I think he was on Suzuki as the manager in 99 when Albertine at Mount Morris was going around the top of this off-camber turn that no one else was doing. He would pass guys every lap doing that thing. So maybe maybe he is still giving those tips out to these riders. He, he, he may be. I, I, that is one. I watched him like a hawk from 1976. Okay? I got the to my, my total technique of running it into the corner, being a very an expert, which most people aren't on the front brake. Knees tight, butt up off the seat. Expert on the front brake. Roger is the, the man there. He, that is him. Yep. And that and that's a great deal to win races.
Okay, a lot of respect for Roger DeCoster. You had an interesting friendship with Marty Tripes. Can you tell me about Marty Tripes as a competitor of yours? Tripes was a very good individual and, and a good friend. And But in his day, when we were racing, M Marty couldn't differentiate friendship and racing. You know, So he either had to be full-on hate you and, and, and try to beat you, or he was buddies with you, and then he really didn't want to beat you up, beat up on you on that day. So, and, and you've told me before that if you made him mad, you thought he could beat you any day. You didn't want to meet, make Marty mad, and you just wanted to play easy with him, and you didn't want to, you didn't want to bust his horns or anything. Because if he does, if he gets serious on a day, he, he wins. Yeah. Uh, he just needed motivation to do it, and he didn't have enough motivation. If when he was motivated, you were getting second. And you said that uh, you had some other tactics to handle Marty Tribes. Honda had him on a diet, didn't Honda you? had him on a diet in 78, and he knew if we came over to his shop. We actually shopped. McCarty shopped for him at this grocery store and knew what he liked, and he'd buy food. And so Marty come over and eat between the races. Honda <laughs> didn't think he was eating, and he'd come over and eat out of the Yamaha pits. And so that good. we kind of kept him plumped up. <laughs> was that to keep him plump or to keep him happy? No, that's to keep him plumped up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got and, and we would psych him out. You know, Marty was all when he was really serious in '78. He would get really pissy with us if we played any jokes on him. Mm -hmm. Two times we're at Supercrosses. I can't see it happening today. But I took a two by four to the starting line. At two minutes to go, we used to have two minutes to go, son. At two minutes to go, when they clicked it, it gets pretty serious. You get on the clock. Everybody's warming their bike up. I take a two by four from McCarty and I stick it through his front fork, <laughs> through his front wheel. Yeah. Which I don't know what would happen today if somebody did that. You know, this is on the Supercross line, and they went batty. I mean, his mechanic was so pissed. They tried to find me and, and all sorts of stuff, but it just freaked him out. Yeah, you know, freaked them, freaked the mechanic out, freaked the rider out. So when we found out that that was so nasty, I mean, that it did such a nasty thing to him, we bought a six-foot hoagie sandwich. And so, two minutes to go, we lit a six-foot hoagie sandwich on the fender, <laughs> and then and then we had to quit it because the AMA got up. <laughs> got a little mad at us, and I think I was getting some serious fines. But stuff like that just freaked him out, right. you know, because he thinks I'm just ja I'm just jacking around at two minutes to go, and he's all serious. He won't even look at me, and I I lay a sandwich over on his fender and go at two <laughs> minutes to go. So, how were you so relaxed on the line? Because you had to be nervous too. You're about I to was go nervous, but I used that stuff as an advantage, I think, to get rid of it. You know, I try not to get too serious right then. Yep. And I think I used the joking around as I, I, I'm sure I did, the joking around. I was nervous inside. Okay. But the joking around helped relieve that. Because if you just sit there all the time and you're really nervous, it just eats on you. And that's what it was doing to him. And being that joking around just serves two purposes. It relieves it from me and it freaks him out a little bit. It would be like something Weiner does. Weiner was always playing pranks. You know, and that's and that's what Weiner did. Weiner was screwing with everybody. Would know. Weiner get to you sometimes? With Wouldn't get games? to me because it didn't matter to me. But he he'd try, and if you could be got to, yeah, he'd get to you. And he was a good guy, but he could separate. You said before. Oh yeah, Weiner was a good guy off the track, bad nasty guy on the track. Yeah. How about earlier in your career? You raced against Marty Smith. You had to dethrone him as the 125 champion. What kind of competitor was Smith, and what kind of relationship did you two have? A hundred percent competitor, no relationship at all. We didn't say. We, I don't know if we said six words to each other the whole year. Uh, very, very good battles. Uh, he, he was the man on the 125. I would say the first year uh, he had he had some bike problems and he and he was going to Europe and he had his troubles. You know, they were running him. Maybe he wasn't he wasn't a very happy camper that first year. I had a good bike and I was fresh out of the box and he was in trouble. You know, that was. Things were going to change. And did you did you go into that season knowing I'm going to knock this negative, guy out? Negative, negative. Well, I did not even think. Uh, I probably never crossed my mind I could beat Marty Smith in '76 till the first race was over. And then I realized, okay, the bike's good, and I'm in shape, and I can beat him if I do my training. Mm -hmm. Because at that time I knew I wasn't as fast as Marty on a, on a qualifying lap, but at, at the end of 45 minutes I was. Did did that first win make you step up your training, or were you already doing your training full force? I think point? it probably made, it had helped me and it helped me realize that yeah, I need to be able to go 45 minutes wide open. Yeah, I need to go. I need to go 30 minutes with the boys, and step it up the last 10. And I knew that through, and that was really my mo and uh, through 78, because uh, in 78. Ellis, Weiner, Pomeroy, 
Marty tripes, more guys than that. If you put time qualifications on, I'm tenth. Mm-hmm. Uh, 250 national and 250 national. I'm tenth. That's what I am. I'm tenth. If you had a one lap race, I'm getting tenth. Yeah. How about a team of 45? Knew. You're still tenth fastest versus their first times. They've all dropped off. Was that your in the 40 in the 45? Yeah. At 30 minutes, I'm tenth. At 40 minutes, I'm going to win. Mm-hmm. Because I would get into a rhythm. At 30 minutes, I'm warming up, and I'm warmed up to race now, and they're tired. Now, I always thought of you as the guy that never went for the whole shot because you felt like you were going to wear these guys out. And I, I think I remember hearing a quote from you that it was too dangerous up there in the first corner. I'm going to hang back. I'll get them all anyway. Was that, did you, was that just training to, and confidence that you could let them go? No, 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 no. I did not like the start. You're right. I don't like the start. I know that if you knock me off in the start, my day is done. And if I could just get through it. And the trouble is being a good starter, you have to have some hair, right? You need to go for it. And Marty Smith's a great starter. He's go, he's going. He, Marty Smith sees himself going through that corner first. I don't. I see myself getting in a log jam down there. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, I don't like it. And I say, if I can get, and, I, and if you're hesitant in the first corner, when I, I had some times in my career that the bike was good and everything, I went for the start, and I actually got some starts mm-hmm. because I got the confidence. But for a lot of my career, I didn't have the confidence. I see I'm in a log jam, and I see these creeps around me going to crash me. And Marty Smith says he sees himself going through that first corner two feet in front of everybody. You know, he just saw it, and he was good at it. And for a while in the, in the late 70s, I could do it. When we had 45-minute motors, it's a totally different race than 30. It's, it's not the same. So it wasn't nearly as important. It wasn't. I could get 10th place start and win. Yeah. In a 30 minute, when they went to 30 minute motos, it really devastated me, to be frank. I, I mean, I was, it was terrible. I couldn't believe they did it. Mm-hmm. I said, well, McCarty, I go, they just killed us. They just killed me. Because we're going to have to change our MO here. I mean, I'm going to have to get starts. Because 30 minutes is where I turn the clock, you know, that's where I turn it on. Yep. And, and so I didn't like that. Now, now, done talking about motocross for a while. After motocross, you went into another kind of competitive racing. That was airplane racing. And what can you apply during the week to airplane racing that makes you a better airplane racer? Nothing. So, <laughs> so, no, how do you, no how do you reach, so how do you reach the top in that, in that field? You have a good plane. <laughs> Is that really what it's about? What it you, have to? To be, you have to be a pilot. You have to know the crap. But you have to have a plane, too. Right. You don't, you don't, you're, not a, you're not a crappy pilot. You're not going to get in there anyway. And yeah. if you're a good pilot and you have a crappy airplane, you're not going to win anyway. <laughs> Okay. No, airplane racing is a different story. A whole different story. So let's go back to your competitors now. Let's close it off by saying, if you could go trail riding or bicycling, you know, with one of your past competitors, who'd be the one guy you'd want to go spend the day with, hanging out with, and talking about old times? Oh, lots. Of, most anybody. Uh, well, there's probably a couple of them out there that I wouldn't, and the rest of them I would. Let's talk about the guys you wouldn't. <laughs> I don't think I'd go with Kent. <laughs> <laughs> Kent and I never got along after those years. Just never, never saw eye to eye. You know, I was tired of. You know, I, I, I don't know what he thinks I am, and nor do I care, but I think he was a sniveller and a baby every week. It didn't matter if he won. If he, if he lost, he cried that he, you know, he had a sore toe, or his wife fed him his porridge wrong that morning, or, you know, or he has a hemorrhoid. And if he won, he was so sick, he just didn't know how he beat us. He was so sick that the rest of us must be so pathetic, right? You know, and we get sick of hearing that. I'm not the only one that got sick of hearing that. I'm sure. Right. On. You know, when I win, I win. And when I lose, you kick my butt. Okay. Very good. I think. I think we got it all, Bob. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for talking. You didn't about get it kids. all. We didn't. There's more to it. <laughs> Maybe we'll, so do, we'll part do something two. next time.